I just wouldn't have had the opportunity to play at Cal and the opportunity to like in higher education and the competitiveness at Cal, like I talked about, it shaped me in so many ways. And so I think just, I always, always with any issue, think about the people who came before me and fought and like the people who didn't have that opportunity, like back to the women who were like playing half court and weren't even allowed to wear shorts and run up and down the court to the people who like were good enough, but couldn't get a scholarship to that first woman who got one and then it's so on and so on and we built. And so I just think it's always trying to remember and honor the people that fought for you. And then like, how do I carry that legacy on and fight for even more and, and keep it intact for the people that come after me? And so I think we just take it for granted in my generation because we're like, yeah, we could always, we all, I always had a WNBA. I always had a scholarship to be had, but there were women who didn't have that, you know, long before. You know, I was rereading that Players' Tribune article that you wrote. I think it's five years ago now at this point. It was 2015. You said so many powerful things in that article, but specifically something that stuck out to me is you said that your very existence challenges every racial, sexual, gender, and religious barrier. So just for some context as we begin this interview, can you describe exactly what you meant when you said that you feel like an outsider, even on the inside of every community that you belong to? Yeah, <laughs> that's, um, I always say like, I can just teach intersectionality by like walking in a room and existing and having conversations with people. So um, as someone who grew up with a white dad and a black mom and is obviously lighter skin, not feeling like you belong to either community, um, I definitely identify as black, but getting that like, well, you're not black enough because you're lighter or because your dad's white or because you talk a certain way. Um, and then within like struggling within the queer, queer community as like a non-binary person or a black person where it's not like you just go to pride parade and you're like the white guy who's like dancing around and you're like cool it's like nope you're still a black woman in this space um or someone who's non-binary so you kind of struggle with there's just a tension where you don't just easily like fit and belong and then obviously as a woman in the sports world you're kind of always you know cast aside we know we're given much less uh, media attention for women's sports um not deemed as you know as official as a man and so just kind of fighting all of those things constantly feeling like you're in the middle of that tension where you're never just like all right cool it'd be nice to just belong to a group that's like i don't have to worry about these things you know i think of as you talk all of the young people who see you listen to you and probably take comfort in having someone that they can relate to on a lot of what you're talking about and look up to you've been an outspoken activist for for several years now how did you find not only your voice, but your confidence to, to talk about and tackle a lot of these issues publicly? Oh, that's a good question. I think some of it was, honestly, some of it was the education I got at Cal, like the awareness for me, although I grew up with a white dad and a, um, oh, a black mom, we didn't really talk about race growing up. So it's like, I, I definitely experienced it and knew what it was like to be in that tension, but they were never like, oh, this is what it's, going to be like for you or like we never talked about police brutality and things so then to go to college and kind of have that awareness and awakening that a lot of people have when you enter a higher institution of learning of like taking I remember taking a sociology class my freshman year and just being like completely mind blown like wait what the or you know the world is organized by race and gender and class and like seeing myself in it but starting to understand the world and the context of it and that just like learning how to think critically about these things was something that I just learned throughout my um, four years at Berkeley and up writing my thesis about uh, like the Castro district in San Francisco. And so just that like awareness and being on a campus where you intermingled with so many different people, like I've never experienced diversity like that in my life. Cause we often talk about diversity and we only need black people. But we don't truly talk about the diversity of seeing someone in a wheelchair, seeing someone who experiences life different than you, than all of like Asian brothers and sisters, like the wide spectrum of people. And so that was a big part of it that built like my consciousness. And then the second side of it was a lot of, I've talked about in the article, kind of my relationship with God and the peace I found with like being okay with who I was as a queer person. And so once I feel like those two things hit and I got into the league, it was like, no one could stop me. Like, you know, God's got me, like, I'm okay. I'm, I'm meant to be this person. And so from there, that confidence just kind of came from within of like, this is just who I am. You know? One of the other things I want to talk about, just, it feels like the a vast majority of the Black Lives Matter movement has been focused on this issue of police brutality on Black men and, and rightfully so. But more and more people, I think, are starting to point out and understand that the protests haven't focused enough on a lot of the issues facing Black women and LGBTQ people within the Black community. So what, what is your perspective on that? 
Yeah, that's well said. It's that's a that's been a tough one because we have been asked as black women so often to show we've been asked to decide between our race and our gender. And so it's kind of that like, well, we got to step up for black people today. Like we got to go march for George Floyd. We got to be the mothers and the sisters and the people out there who, you know, picture our dads or our brothers or cousins um, and march in the street. And so we are finally starting to see an awakening like this was kind of this undercurrent cry for Breonna Taylor this whole time. Like, what about Breonna Taylor? Her murders are still out there. Like we're not discussing it. There was no video to circulate. And so we're starting to finally, finally see people pay attention to the struggles that Black women have. And then recently, within the last week, that Black trans women just experienced violence and murder and disembodiment embodiment at like such a high rate. And we're starting to have those conversations too. And so even a week ago, I was saying like, where, where are the people marching for Brianna in Black trans lives? And then we saw them. It was almost like a few days ago, it was like, oh, like here they are, finally we're seeing that. And so I do feel a level of hope in that people are starting to see, like we do need to step up for black women as well. And this is something as our WNBA season has been announced, we've been talking about in our league's 80% black women of, you know, potentially dedicating the season to say her name, which is the campaign that is to say the names of murder victims, victims of violence, um, and not let them be forgotten. So potentially doing that in kind of remembrance of the black women who've been forgotten. The season is officially going to happen in July in Florida at IMG Academy. Uh, you're VP of the Players Association. So tell us, how did this come together? And, and what, what do we need to know about the WNBA season of 2020? <laughs> it's been a long time coming. Yeah. After, after negotiating that CBA, we thought like, oh, woo, we're done. This is going to be amazing. And then, of course, 2020 hit everybody. And we're like, we find ourselves back in the negotiation tables trying to figure out what a season can look like this year. And so... Um, just when it finally came out that we'd gone to a player vote and like it, you know, it passed that we agreed to a proposal, it's just exciting because I think there's so much opportunity to be had with 144 players together. I think where people aren't paying enough attention to the power of what we can do as a collective, being in one place, obviously being some of the first live sports back to television is a really big deal. Um, and everyone's kind of you spoke to this, of the rallying cry of like, follow black women now, like people are awakening to that. And like I said, our, our league is 80% black women. We have quite a few out queer women too. Of like, we are the women we should be following. Like we've been here all along. We've been doing this work. We, you know, we're along with Colin Kaepernick back in 2016, not always getting recognized for it. have been outspoken forever, always kind of being forward thinking. And I think the opportunity for us to come back and to be centered in sports where we're so often marginalized is something that excites me in a way that's like we could truly, you know, catalyze on this moment and what it would mean for all of us to be together in a way that could organize and use our voice. It's like the the world needs to be made back right now. And I just think about all the people who would be inspired by, you know, getting to see us play on the court and, you know, what we have to say as well.